You want the noise brought on you? Because here it comes. What? The noise. All right, guys, we're going to bring in our guest for today's episode. Uh, we have Mike Curlin. He's the host of the Bases Loaded Pod. Mike, thank you for coming on The Noise, man. Man, I'm just happy to be here. I appreciate you having me. What's going on? Uh, nothing much. We wanted to uh, really talk about fantasy baseball, obviously, that, you know, being your forte. And, you know, where we are right now is that the season is going to be starting, you know, momentarily and uh we know a lot of people are getting in those last minute fantasy drafts and we want to know if you have any uh, pieces of advice for them run run away no kidding <laughs> uh, man there's just so much going on it's crazy uh you can obviously follow me on twitter at mike underscore curl and hit me up with any questions the base load podcast I, i'm trying to do as much content as possible written and obviously like i said you can find the, the written work on twitter and then the podcast i'm trying to get as much info to you as possible because with these last minute drafts come just so much need for information there's so many players uh leaving last minute on covid some are asymptomatic some are symptomatic how that how that could what how that differs what that can mean for you and your teams how you should go about drafting some of these guys there's a lot going on and i know drafts the, the big draft weekend just passed but we're going into those final days and people are drafting these final few, few days because they're trying to wait for the very last moment because of the covid we're talking we're talking about guys that literally had no issues all or what all three weeks of the summer camp that's been so far and this final week they just get it like it's crazy so it is what it is obviously you got to deal with it got to kind of work through it and that's the that's the goal to help you get through that and there's just, there's just so much again like it was such a loaded question so simple for you to ask but it was just so loaded there's just so much <laughs> so any any questions just hit me up and i'm glad i'm gladly to answer them i can't talk tonight don't mind me <laughs> yeah definitely um so, you know, some of the notable players, uh, we, you know, we know the Braves have been pretty heavily affected with Freddie Freeman and uh, I believe um, Will Smith also getting hit with the uh, coronavirus. And then uh, DJ LeMayhew, although he's fine on the Yankees, as well as Aroldis Chapman, Shatman, who I haven't seen yet. I'm not sure if he's in. Um, but, you know, do you think there are any teams that are specifically hit hard? And, um, you know, does that open up some some opportunities to draft some, you know, some uh secondary players it's not it's weird it's almost like affected teams almost evenly it's like one big player here one big player there surprisingly enough there hasn't been any huge like one team has it worse than others the braves did have it as far as like notable players and they signed us puig and then puig got it before he gave him clear his medical before he gave him clear the background so he never even made it to the team so it's really team dependent there's teams like the rays like austin meadows just got it They've had no issues with with COVID, except for I think Glassnow was late to Glassnow report. Glassnow also, yeah. But he was late to report. But it's like you see, like teams are get, guys are getting it, and they're coming back, and the other guys are getting it. So there hasn't been a team that's lost like half their team yet. So it's just been names here and there, and like it's just you just have to know who to look for at what and what, on what team, like and how to adapt to that. So like I said, the Rays come to mind because of uh, Meadows and Glassnow. Glassnow's back, but he's not ramping up. Or he hasn't ramped up to where he needs to be. So he's going to be a slow starter. But where he's going in drafts right now, you're still paying as if he didn't miss any time and as if he's starting like with a full in inning workload. So he's a guy you got to take a step back. And it's, and Meadows is a guy that you kind of have to let him drop a couple rounds because apparently I, I believe he's symptomatic, which makes a huge difference. And for those who don't know, I've actually – and I'm pretty open about this. Both my parents are fine, but they both actually had it. They both actually had the coronavirus. And they are older, so they're not athletic. They're not athletes and they're not in the – the peak of their prime so i can't really i can't speak for how an athlete will deal with it but my parents were symptomatic and they both were knocked got knocked out for like what felt like 10 or so days really hit them hard and then it took them a few days to feel normal and then we saw freddie freeman and scott kingery both of which have since returned from covid and these guys were symptomatic and it's taken them some time to kind of get their reps in it could take these guys two weeks. It could take these guys a month. You have a guy like Jordan Alvarez on the Astros who hasn't even reported yet, and it never even he was never confirmed to have it. But you have to assume. And with I guess like it's a long winded way of saying every team has a player, so you just gotta know where to look when it comes to the Rays. Maybe a guy like uh, Yoshi Susugo and G Man Choi. Maybe they don't platoon as much. Maybe Hunter Renfro gets a bigger bigger run. The thing is with the Rays though, they have so many pieces. They, if if there's a team built for that, it's them. Uh, Rays the Braves. Are deep always and they, they they like to platoon players and right. they they can now 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 they really can you take 
you take away a spot from them, all it does is give them an extra place to play around. And uh, you have the team like the Braves, though. They they still have the depth, but not as much because they they dealt with Freddie Freeman, who's back now, but now you know not getting Puig. They had Marcakis opt out, so you had Marcakis opt out. You have Freddie still trying to get up the speed, and you have an opening at third base still like that fight between Austin Riley and Johan Camargo. So th- there's that whole situation, and it's it's a tough one because people think it's Riley, but I'm starting to think Duvall. Um, Duvall's all over there on the bench. He might get the playing time at first base if Freddie's not ready to go or in the outfield. And then you have um, Johan Camargo, who they came out and said they wanted to play him ahead of R- Riley before. So I'm not as big on Riley as others are. And the Astros will be the last one to touch on because it's just another team, just a big name. Jordan, Jordan Alvarez was a guy going in like the end of the third round in a lot of drafts. And he's a guy that we have no idea what's going on. And then you pair that with the fact that even in spring training, he wasn't even playing in the field and his knees were having a hard time keeping up with him. Young kid. No track record. Track record of health has been limited. He's, he's been kind of hurt, all, even in the minors. But he's a guy that you would think it's Kyle Tucker. But tonight, Kyle Tucker didn't even get the start in a game. Like these games kind of matter. Like we're seeing summer league games happening, and these games normally don't matter so much in spring training. But with less time to ramp up, with getting lineups kind of co- that cohesion going and getting guys the reps that they need, these lineups do matter a little more than your average lineups, I would say. And Kyle Tucker didn't even get the chance to DH tonight. It was Ledmus Diaz, so. When people think Kyle Tucker might be up, he's a guy that I'm kind of still off of because they're not giving him the playing time. And Dusty Baker has a track record of not playing his uh, young guys. So I, I almost gave more names to avoid than I, than I did to actually target. Yeah. But there's just so many situations. And it's just so yeah. like it's team team by team. Uh, it's specific to like, everything. It's, it's, it's a lot. You see my hands go up because it's like, <laughs> yeah. I gotta breathe. Like it's it's so much. Uh, I told you I warned you I was a talker, so you get me started. Don't worry about it. I'm well, just gonna keep going, man. To jump in there, um, you know this is this is something we talk about from a from a fantasy perspective is so different from a uh, a betting perspective about certain teams because you know you love the teams like the Rays who have a lot of depth and you know oh, that. Yeah. You know, you can count on them to win games because they're going to they're going to find out, you know, what's the best matchup even, you know, to, to avoid playing certain guys in certain spots. And and I talked about the Rays a little bit before on the show of just, you know, some they're of the awesome. signings they had. Sugo, I talked about even I, I wrote an article about the um, Nippon Professional Baseball League and just how um, his team in uh, Yokohama, they're going to be just missing an all around complete player. You got guys like Renfro coming from the Padres. You got uh, Jose Martinez from the, from the Cardinals. I mean, these guys are just hitters and they're going to cycle them through these corner infield spots, uh, outfield spots, excuse me, um, where they don't really have to play too much defense and they're, they're going to be really, really valuable. But you know, then you look at it from a fantasy perspective and yeah, it's great to have these guys with, you know, you know, they're going to have some opportunities, but it's going to be it become hard to gauge, you know, well, from a daily perspective, you can you can say, OK, well, I know this, you know, Renfro is going to mash lefties and play right field. But, you know, from a from a season perspective, are we really going to uh, can we count on Renfro to get enough at bats? No, exactly. And if we're talking daily, that's a whole like you said, it's a whole other ball game because right. a, a team like the Rays and for betting purposes, I'm not a guy who specializes in that by any means. But I can tell you the Rays just by knowing the team dynamics, the ins and outs. And I was telling you again that. Um, if you go to my Twitter, I have the links and I I write these articles. I take every lineup from all these summer training games and I just make notes. I say I see who's in, who's out, who's getting the playing time, who's batting where. And a team that never, I mean, I haven't even looked at their lineup and there's no holes in it anyway is the Rays. And that's without Meadows because they have so much depth of just solid quality guys. So you take that into perspective with betting like, oh, okay, so now you know their offense is always going to be solid. There's no, It's not flashy, but it's good. And then you have their... They're obviously the starting rotation is really good, but what people are worried about is like a glass not not ramped up. Glass not can go three innings. They have the depth to piggyback another starter off them or just play the bullpen because their bullpen yeah. is one of the best in the league, if not the best in the league. It's up there with the Yankees, and it's just a, a bullpen that you can count on. So if Glass now goes three or four strong innings, you can still you can hit that first five inning bet or and just kind of go that route if you want to play the first five just to play it safe because. But the Rays are a team that I wouldn't be afraid to bet, bet them for the full game because they have such a strong bullpen you can depend on. And not a lot of teams you can say that about, like the Indians. The Indians, for instance, they're a team with great starting options as far as starting pitchers go. But if they get through the sixth inning with a one, one or two run lead, I don't trust them to hold that lead through the end because they only have like Krinchak and Brad Hand, and that's pretty much it. That bullpen is really, really bad. So that's a team that 
if I'm like, I might only bet the first five innings type of thing on them because I'm afraid to let that thing go the full, the full nine because I just don't trust that bullpen. So that's where fantasy and betting kind of mesh. My, my, my knowledge of the player pool because of fantasy helps me know and understand teams and their dynamic and their tendencies. And that's where we, you and I kind of cross paths. I'm not going to be able to give the great advice you can give when it comes to betting, but I know so much in-depth knowledge about each and every team and how they utilize players that it would work well together. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, there's this weird balance of like, I should right. be able to bet well. I should be able to bet well in theory because I can almost tell you every day who's available out of the bullpen, who's not. Things like like little intricate things that a lot of people just don't follow. And for mm-hmm. some reason, when I try to bet, I just I honestly break even more times than not. And it's crazy because you would think I should like in theory I should know. But I just, I just, it doesn't seem to line up for me. It's that's, really, you know, the the pricing element of it is is a different ball game, you know, because, um, you know, it's how do you gauge, um, how do you gauge when you know a team has an advantage, but is the price right for you mm-hmm. for you to take advantage of that, you know, advantage? So, uh, and again, I would I would recommend to everyone listening, this is what you listen to the Noise Podcast for. Uh, we you know we'll be looking to point out uh, these kinds of spots where, you know, you know, we talk about the we could talk about the Yankees all we want, how you know the offense is great, Garrett Cole is going to be great, the bullpen is great, but you know when they're uh, minus three. 300 against the Orioles to three straight days. I, that's just not val- There's not value in that. You know, you're not going to pay three dollars. I'll say take them minus one and a half runs, but then that well, becomes yeah. really risky. That becomes really risky because even though the, the, in theory, the Yankees should cover one and a half runs almost any time they play the Orioles, but it's baseball. Like it's right. just like any sport. Like when you said uh, giving a, giving up one and a half runs is like giving up a touchdown or seven and a half points in football. It's just Back a lot. Door. It's a lot to give up, period. Right. And and, and <laughs> that's yeah. And that's also to your to your point about understanding the bullpens of teams, understanding who is available, because that's key, right? You you know, you mentioned the Indians. Um, you know, Shane Beaver, Carlos Carrasco, I mean, uh, Mike Clevenger, like these are these are great starters on top of mm-hmm. their other guys like uh Sival or you know, who else they're throwing out there. But please you know, I think got the last spot. okay, please sack. Yeah, I mean you're not gonna you're not going to trust them to bridge the gap between the the sixth and the ninth to get to Brad hand really. And, and that makes that one and a half run. It's so risky for them. And and you'll see that price then you'll see the Indians have high prices sometimes on that one and a half because the bullpen is so shaky, but you know, you gotta, you gotta pay attention to those things and you know, you gotta kind of try and figure out, you know, what are the manager's tendencies? And I think in a 60 game season, it's going to be super heightened. Where like, you know, you don't know exactly what managers are going to think. You don't know who's going to approach the game a little bit differently. So, you know, we, we've been kind of preaching really staying small and, and, and staying sharp. But um, from a from a fantasy perspective, you know, going going back to that, it's really like, that, you know, the, having more information and understanding who's in the game at what time is valuable across the board. And I think now, you know, going into the real the real final push for drafts, it's really going to be important to understand Who's on the team? Who's behind them? And and what are they going to do in terms of at bats? Are, are we going to have guys shift around the diamond to get more at bats? Are we going to have guys platooning? So this and this information is is not too easy to find, but it's not too difficult either. You know, you really got to you got to pay attention to these things. And and I'm you know I'm sure you have more to to add to that of how people can really do that. It's just a matter of literally what. I guess the way the best way to put it is like mining the news. That's actually an article that's written by Jeff Zimmerman, a great in, industry like well-known guy and that's the term that comes to mind because you have to pretty much like i wake up in the morning i have my cup of coffee in one hand and i'm reading the the latest news because it's like that's the difference in in such a short year every little micro transaction matters so i'm reading news I'm, I'm just going through what matters what doesn't and like i said i go through the effort of personally trying to put out all these lineup things because i think these lineup things matter right now and i'm, I'm doing my part trying to help people just get ready for the unknown of these final drafts because the like we're getting some answers and there's something like for instance and it's called like i hate i don't do victory laps i I don't really care for them i actually enjoy laughing at myself for what i get wrong (laughs) but this is one thing i've been kind of i I actually found a tweet from march 5th that cesar hernandez like was was fighting for like a top two spot in the in the lineup in the rotation no lineup sorry not a pitcher he's a hitter in the lineup and people were like people were kind of giving me like a hard time push back i'm like no this is just the trends you're monitoring the trends and next thing you know i'm um, what what are we in july now <laughs> or august what are we yeah we're in july <laughs> sorry i'm losing track of the months it's quarantine um next thing you know 
he, word comes out like a week ago. Oh, by the way, Mercado is hitting the bomb lineup. Cesar, Cesar Hernandez is going to be leading off. And it's like, I've tried to tell you this, and that goes back to just monitoring trends. And a lot of teams won't show their hands in spring training, but the Indians were. So it's one of those things like I don't pay attention like summer the summer training. I'm watching. There's a game on in the background. If you see me looking away, it's because I'm actually look, kind of I'm peeking at a game while while talking. But it's the ADD. It kicks in. It's really really bad. Um, and now I forgot. I, was, I went off my off my tangent, but um, it doesn't matter. I forgot. I was, what was I saying again? <laughs> of course, my ADD kicked in. I mean, talking about uh, Hernandez being at the top of the lineup and understanding how they, the, the Indians kind of tip their hand, but other teams yeah. might not. Yeah, 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 sorry. I I have really bad ADD and it's not medicated. Um, when it comes to spring training, summer training, the stats themselves don't necessarily matter to me because pitchers are working on stuff. Hitters are working on new stances, new approaches. And then you have the um, – and then you just – so like I said, the stats kind of go out the window, but the lineups, the – and little things like that, where play, like positions that players are playing in, stuff like that matters because if a player like, um, like Listella actually tonight, Listella is a guy that's like on the outside looking in for the Angels. Tom Listella is like, we're trying to figure out a place where he's where is he, he going to play. Might be more of a utility guy. And tonight they showed a way that they can utilize him on days where Otani is pitching because Otani is a two way player, which is awesome by the way for the sport. Otani's not Otani's not going to be hitting the day before, the day of, and the day after he's pitching. That's three games or two or three games a week, roughly. Lestella is going to probably plug in and play, but now we found out that Pujols will probably move to DH. Lestella will get his time at first base, so maybe he doesn't have first base first base eligibility in fantasy leagues. But seeing how they're utilizing him, you know or can expect possibly that he'll gain that shortly into the season if he doesn't already have it. And you can see how they're trying to manufacture plate appearances for him, so he might take a little bit of a ding in your weekly formats, but in daily he might have some more value. So there's just little things like that you got to pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, um, talking about the Angels, like they'll, they'll, you know, they'll look to move around Listella and Fletcher and, and Tice, and and um, they have another infielder as well, Marte, I believe. Right? Um, they're going to be really trying to move them around. Trying to think about the team off the top of my head, Rendon. They have uh, Rendon, Pujols, Tice, uh, Sim- Anderson, Simmons. Right, um, He's, he'll be in, in trench. There's a, that, say, there's a, there's a, I'm just saying, there's a whole bunch of like. Move, move uh, David Fletcher is the other one that just movable pieces, right? Whole bunch of them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of teams like that, and I guess you know again th- that's the distinction between daily fantasy and and you know looking at drafting a full season league is really like you know these plug and play guys. How valuable are they? So I guess you know with that kind of you know as a question now, w- would that really depend on league size um, in terms of like how how much? how many players that you're able to actually keep, how many players are available on a daily basis, you know, how much does that go into, um, how much does league size go into um, how you approach drafting uh, a team? Well, it's definitely a big, big deal. League size and type. My big thing, always know your rules. It sounds simple, but I've been guilty of it. I've gone into a league thinking it's one thing. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know that was, that was the case. And then my team, what I thought was a great team ended up being like a mediocre team. Because just you have to know your just know your league, know your rules. Start there. Once you see that, you see your league size, you see your league size, you see your um, and how many teams are in it and all that. And then you got you kind of adapt. Like if it's a daily league, you can take chances on players that kind of pop in and out of lineups that are in that are in platoons because if they're on the strong side of a platoon, you'll still get like good numbers, and then you can kind of pair them with someone on, on even on a weak side of a platoon or just somebody that you know will play more often, and you can kind of make two players into one. But you have to be right. careful because in a shallow league, you don't really want to waste a bench spot on a guy who's only going to be playing part time because shallow the shallower the league, the better the players are available for you to pick up. So you got to kind of pay attention to that. But in a weekly league, if there's a if you if you are in a weekly league where you set your lineup every Monday, you don't really want to target guys on a platoon because now you're losing at bats. It normally wouldn't bo- it normally wouldn't bother me because over 162 games. A guy like Brandon Lau, where he was going to most likely play for, again, going back to the race, he was probably going to be playing against righties. Good power, good speed, good for your categories if you play Roto. And he was just a guy that if you only play against righties, he was still going to give you probably 25 and 10 for the year. 25 home runs, 10 stone bases, which again in Roto is very, very valuable. And you can afford to miss a day here and there with his platoon. In a short season, plate appearances and at bats are currency. You can't afford to do that, and especially in a weekly league, you can't afford to take that hit. So it matters more in your. In it all comes back to what the league size is and the right. and the format. Because 
in a daily league, I'll still take him because I can plug in another piece for him. And the deeper the league, I still want that skill set. So I'll take him. And again, it's all, if, if you have the knowledge, the knowledge base for these deeper formats, you can kind of find some diamonds in the rough and you can kind of plug and play with those. Yeah. You, you got to be careful about these rays, man. They, they have, I think, three players um, that are on their roster named Lau or Low. Well, however they pronounce it. There's, Nate, there's Nate Lowe, <laughs> Nate Lowe, Brandon Lau, and then in the minors, I think it's Josh Lowe. I think he's the yeah. brother to one of them. Not sure which one. He's the brother to one of them. Yeah, Nate yeah. Nate is the one that he's playing mostly second base, and he, he's he got the most pop, I think. So he's, Brand, he's the that's guy. Brandon, Brandon Lau plays second. Nate Lowe plays first. Yeah, yeah. And then Josh Lowe or Lau. I don't know which one he is. I told you he's down there. He plays, I think, infield as well. The, the team is littered with talent, and their their minors are ridiculously loaded. That team is like yeah. they've built their team up. It's crazy what they've done. They've changed the game of baseball. You have the Brewers who actually kind of copied them this year with that whole mm-hmm. that whole piecing together, like almost like a Frankenstein type of roster. Yeah, and you know Yankee fan here, so I don't want to talk too much about the Rays. Uh, but um, that's, uh, the the Brewers are a team I wanted to ask you about. So for me, from a betting perspective, um, I was able to get their number for um, for games at twenty nine and a half. I got the over on that. Seeing that they finish 500 to me is kind of ridiculous that it would be priced lower than that. And I also like them to win the division, actually, because um, I think you're getting some some value in that price. So, you know, aside from that, though, um, you know, talking about the Rays, how do you value a guy like Ryan Braun or, um, you know, uh, a guy like Justin Smoke, where, you know, we don't really know how much they're necessarily going to be playing. We don't know their health status and but they can utilize that DH and get these guys born at bats. So Braun was pretty much, I feel like, was locked in. And why I say was is because I'd say a couple hours ago, like really, it's relatively recent. He was pretty much stated that he's out. He's not like not that he's out, but he's hurt right now. He didn't, he couldn't even DH because he's hurt. I was like, wow, okay. So <laughs> that's that's not what we want to hear from a guy who's ailing, like dealing with like arm. Or I think it's a shoulder. He just wasn't able to throw this spring. So I'm thinking, all right, cool. He'll be able to DH. But now if he's not DHing. A guy like Justin Smoke, who might have been, I mean, he he's already pegged for first base, but now this would all but I feel like assure him almost every day at bats, assuming again with the DH, it depends on how they treat the DH. But just looking at their roster, I mean, you have guys like Ryan Healy, Logan Morrison, which we've seen them guys, we've seen guys like that do uh, hit for power here and there and be solid contributors. I honestly don't know how they're going to go about um, addressing that if Braun's hurt. Uh, it's 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 tough. I mean, Braun was a guy I was expecting to play every day, along with Smoke for the most part. And I said, like I said, I figured Ryan Healy would be spelling them on occasion, but I don't know what, what they're gonna do with Braun. I'm just I'm just getting. Uh, I guess Jed uh, Jed Jerko and Brock Holt. They have again. They have like these guys that just do a little bit of everything, play a right. little bit of every position. They're okay. They can take on an injury, but this team. I think is underrated, and I like that you took them because I think even though they don't, again, they they have Yelich. I shouldn't say they don't have anybody. They have Yelich, but they have like just a little bit of everything going on here to where I think they can be a competitive team. And if you look at like looking at that division, going back to the other bet you made, the Pirates are trash. <laughs> like just call it for what it is. The Cardinals right. are always competitive, but they're not that great. And they're the a team talent that's actually, level is lacking. I think. Especially in the bullpen, because you look at the bullpen and you see like Gallegos is should be. I think he's back. He's a guy that I've been trying to monitor. He, I think he's he back. Said he's going to be ready. Yeah, and then you had um, Helsley, who should be possibly closing. But then they have Carmart, who they've been toying with back and forth with the rotation and the bullpen. How deep will he go into games? They don't obviously. Jordan Hicks opted out, and that team just seems like it's missing some bullpen pieces to kind of pieces to kind of keep them in most games but the cardinals always they're a scrappy team so i don't want to count them out the only the team obviously the favorite has to be the reds win the division they made all the acquisitions they've made they have a good bullpen they have a great rotation they are by far the favorite for sure to win it but it's also a lot of the players first year together is there gonna be an issue meshing issue yeah an issue an issue, i can't i'm not, like i'm feel like i'm you got wrong, it sorry yeah you got it then not like it came out right um i'm just afraid they're gonna have a little bit of an issue and then Again, it's a it's a sixty game season. You really don't know. We saw, I think, the Nationals last year in their first sixty games won like nineteen of them, something crazy low like that. So they were a team that they and gone they went on to win the World Series. So you, we're gonna see crazy things happen. And the Brewers winning the division wouldn't be a crazy thing. And I think they might be the second best team in that division. And I know there's Cubs fans out there saying, "Well, what about us?" 
I'm not impressed. Your bullpen is probably one of the worst in the league when it comes to contenders. You won't call the Cubs a contender, but you look at that bullpen and they're even the rotation outside of Darvish is really uninspiring. And yeah, Kyle Hendricks is pretty good. And but. and Darvish at times, you know, has long cold stretches. Um, so yes. that's, you know, in a 60 game season, that's, that's heightened. That's a problem. And we've seen, you know, guys like, you know, Lester, she's just getting older and, uh, Quintana as well. You know, he, he could be a stud for six weeks, but he could also be a dud. Um, so I worry about, I worry about them a lot. And, and like you mentioned with the bullpen, I mean, I think their best guy is like Rowan Wick. I mean, I'm, you know, they signed Jeremy Jeffress, but I, I, there's a reason he's not on the Brewers anymore. Um, and, and talking about the Reds, uh, you know, I, I'm very concerned with teams that have not great defenses. Um, nothing about the Reds screams good defense. I know Nick Castellanos wants to play the outfield for some godforsaken oh. reason. Um, but Mike Misakis at second base is is okay. He's not a bad defender. Yeah, I, was, I was surprised when I was surprised when I saw that, too, yeah, about him being tough. decent at second base. That's tough. Suarez is not known for his defense. Votto's, you know, a great defender, but the bat is lacking. I, I don't see Nick Senzel as a center fielder, but where are they going to play him? So, um, you know, I, I, I'm very weary of teams with bad defenses, especially when we don't know how pitching is going to look. We don't know how hitting is going to be, how these guys are going to be ready for the season. The only thing that's always true is defense. And again, I hate to go talk about the Rays, but the Rays have amazing defense every season. Um, another team I like, the Royals, who they're going to be playing these guys. And, you know, these scrappy Royals, you know, they're going to be playing better defense than everybody else. And I think that that's a problem with teams like the Reds and, and to an extent, the Cubs as well. Um, the, problem, the, pro- the problems with <laughs> the problem with the Royals, surprisingly, their offense, I was looking at tonight. I was like, it's actually not bad. Like their offense, no, actually, not. but their their pitching staff is atrocious. Danny Duffy is like a number four, number five on most teams. He's their ace. Like it's atrocious that that pitching staff and their bullpen is not much better. Like that team yeah. is that's what's holding them back. But they have a lot of really good pitchers in the minors. They actually, again, might be ready to compete sooner than later. If these young pieces come together on the offensive side, they added Franchi Cordero. If they can if they can make Franchi what they turn Solaire into. Then you're looking at a team that has the offense, and if and if these pitchers in their minor league system come up to be what they what they should be or could be, then you're looking at a team that can to win. They they just won a World Series not so long ago. They could probably do it yeah. again. I mean, I, we're gonna we, we're, we're gonna get a full season. Well, uh, <laughs> I should say full season. We're gonna get a a half ish full season out of Brady Singer most likely. So I'm I'm excited to see that. If we, yeah, I'm, I just don't trust the Royals do the right thing. Hopefully they do the whole bring them up after a week. Cause that's the, that's another thing. You'll see a lot of these young guys come up after seven or 10 days, whoever it is, because they, uh, the whole extra year of service time, they get right. that, they get it after, uh, like, I think they have to, they have to play less than 62 days of service time or something like that. Yeah. They, they have, um, I, I don't know how they're going to exactly have it going this year, but they are going to go in with, with, with expanded rosters, so you're going to have that 30 team. So, I mean, that's when they're going to be trying out your, your Trevor Rosenthal's and, and those kinds of guys to see if they'll stick with the team maybe. And, um, but you know, the Royals, I think, you know, like you mentioned, offense is not so bad. Michael Franco was a pretty decent side uh, signing from an offense perspective. I think Dozier is a, is a decent outfielder. Uh, Whit Merrifield actually grades better in center field than at, he does at second base. Um, so, and, I think that, you know, obviously Soler cannot touch the field, but, <laughs> <laughs> but Nicky Lopez and Mondesi up the middle, that's a great combination. I love Bobby Witt. I don't think he's going to play this year much or, or at all, but, you know, the, the Royals are a team I'm looking on uh, on the up and up a little bit. That's like your 2022 team or something. To think about. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Um, well, but yeah. Fortunately for you, because if you're a Yankees fan, that's the AL. So right. keep them keep them irrelevant for a while. You'd be happy. Yeah. Um, so I kind of what I've talked about on, on this show a little bit is is uh, season win totals. And, and I, I another team I wanted to ask you about is the White Sox. They're getting a lot of um, a lot of a lot of press. And, and I, I'm not sold. I don't I don't like the combination. Again, this is another team. I hate their defense. It's awful. It um, and I don't think Tim Anderson is is really that great. And I was gonna, I'm curious about what you think of them, um, the bigger guys, especially Grandal, Abreu, um, Anderson. From a fantasy perspective, are you at all concerned with a step back from from some of their better hitters? 
Um, honestly, not really from a fantasy perspective, but from like I was actually the the real life aspect is what intrigues me because from a fantasy aspect, a lot of these guys aren't really being reached on. A lot of these guys are going for fair value in drafts, and I have no issue with like where most of these guys are going. Yohan Makata was a guy who just returned from COVID, and he batted second tonight, so obviously he's on track for opening day. And we saw him. We the thing about him and Tim Anderson, we saw both of them take a step forward in their in their um profile. They both changed it up a little bit at the plate. Uh, Tim Anderson showing a little more patience, but he's always an aggressive guy. He doesn't. He, he even says it. He's come out and said he doesn't. Come, he doesn't go to the plate trying to walk. So right. he doesn't get on base. His on base percentage is low. The problem is, is with a guy with on base guy with that type of attitude. Unless he hits for a high average, he won't get on base. And if he's not on base, that makes for a terrible leadoff guy. Right. So from from a real life aspect. Madrigal should be leading off one of these days, but he's not. He might not even uh, debut with the team. Crazy enough. So you have Tim Anderson from a life aspect. I don't think he's going to again repeat that uh, the to be the AL hitting champ again. But I've, I've seen crazier things. I've seen seeing him win. It was crazy because that profile just screams that he's not going to. Right. But in terms of fantasy, like I said, Tim Anderson. He's he, because of his position. Shortstop is so deep for the fantasy side of things that it pushes him down. But he offers he offers power and speed. And speed being such a premium in fantasy leagues, he's somebody that you shouldn't be you shouldn't shy away from. But again, that position being so deep, he just falls because of that. So if you wait on shortstop, he's a good fallback option. And then going back to Yohan Mankata, I think he I don't think he's gonna regress. I mean, the guy had the pedigree and he's gotten a little better every year. And last year was kind of that, oh, everything was clicking. I think he can continue that because what he was doing wasn't un, didn't scream like unsustainable. It just it seems something that he should be able to continue the growth in. The problem is, is in a sixty game season, you just it's hard to judge anything. Like I could I could be right about all this, I could be wrong about all this, and this is the year you're going to see a lot of fantasy analysts be, be able be able to take. <laughs> they're either going to take their wins and be like, oh yeah, look, I was right, and if they're wrong, oh well, it was a shortened season. I, I who be, we're all wrong, so you're going to have a lot of cop outs. I'm what I'm going to try to take away from this as a whole is just watching for tangible change, and I preach tangible change because. You can kind of take away from that. Like if somebody's throwing a different pitch or throwing a different pitch mix and gets a ref- effective results, then it's easier to believe. And the, again, that goes back, circling back to around to your question, like with Anderson Mankata, those guys kind of showed a tangible change in their approach and the results followed. So I'm more, that's why I'm more buying in. I'm not buying into Anderson at, <laughs> at what he did last year. But the other right. guys, Gr- Grandal, he's solid. And Carnacion, he's older, but he's still going to do his thing. Jose Abreu, there's no real decline in his profile either. So these guys are all going in a range where it's a fair price for them for fantasy, and and they're going to perform. But as far as the real-life aspect goes, I think there's a lot of ups and downs that are probably going to happen here because the middle of the lineup is really solid, but that the top, the, the top of the lineup, I'm scared they're not going to get on base a lot. I'm scared there's going to be a lot of guys like you're, you're going to have games where Tim Anderson's on base four times and then on base none, which can, right. you know, that that's you want the top of your lineup game on base for those powerhouse guys in the middle to kind of do damage. But it's not the offense I'm worried about. I'm not really worried about the bats. I'm worried about the defense, like you said, and the pitching. They have Lucas Giolito, and then after that, it's a bunch of question marks. Dallas Keuchel. I don't know if he's. I mean, he. We showed. We see. He saw. We saw him win the Cy Young. That's about it. I believe he won the Cy Young. I remember when that was. <laughs> it was a couple. It was. It was with the Astros, I believe. Um, I mean, when, when you look at that, you know, like uh, to me, you know, Dallas Keuchel is a name, but do you really see him being much more valuable than Gio Gonzalez? And That's the thing. Do you really see Gio Gonzalez as being that valuable? And if you don't, then you know, I just named your number two and three starters in this team, or two and four, if you want. Um, that's concerning. This defense also is is awful. Larry Garcia does not make much sense in right field. Um, you know, Jimenez is is not good, but you know he's not there to to hit. And Edwin Encarnacion actually grades as a better defender than Jose Abreu, which to me is concerning. But I will say, world class move by the White Sox to move Moncada over to third. Like he, that's just like really is a catalyst for his transformation to me. But you know. That that was a good move, but other than that, uh, I think they're kind of lacking in 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 good moves. The lineup to me just it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like I, I like the players, it just doesn't it doesn't fit. I'm looking at it too. Yeah, it's just a lot of like, oh, these are very awesome. These these players are going to be awesome, but I feel like I don't know. But then again, you do have Encarnacion and Grandal who do get on base a lot. They right. they hit for power, but at least they get on base. And then they put the way I'm looking at it, roster resource is um they're having Eloy slot behind them, which I, we we saw that today actually. So if Eloy slots behind them, it gives them some RB opportunities. I'm not so again. It's not really the lineup. It's just it's the pitching. It goes back to the pitching and defense. 
you only have, it's, it's like a triangle. And they only have one third of they only have one solid side of, of the three sides because Lucas Giolito, I believe everything that we saw last year. I think that's really who he is. I'm not concerned, but he's like you mentioned respect before. Yeah. That. And he, he made, he's another guy who went to um uh, drive line. He went to drive line and made all those changes. And if you, if people don't know about drive line, it's one of like top end, like training facilities in the country. It's fantastic. And you look at it, but like I said, other than him, you have a bunch of question marks. And you have Reynaldo Lopez, who has the potential, but hasn't done it. You have Dylan Cease, who has the potential and hasn't done it. And then you look at the bullpen. Aaron Bummer is about all I trust in. Alex Colome, I don't know how he does what he did last year as far as success, but it looks like it's just one of those trains ready to come off the rails type of things when you look at his peripherals. And then outside of that, there's not – I mean, Jimmy Cordero is interesting, and then a couple other names are like, eh. But that's, that's the thing. When you don't have a strong bullpen – and without a strong rotation, they're going to have to outscore, out hit their teams, which is that possible? Sure, but you can't bet on a team to do that. So the offense might play, but the pitching, I don't think will. Right. And uh, I don't know if you know, but are we, are we going to see any of Michael Kopech this year? He opted out, actually. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. That, 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 I don't know if that's really a blow just because he's, he's so unproven. But, you know, when you talk about live arms and guys with potential, I mean, that, that's the first thing that screams, you know, that comes oh, to yeah, mind for me. He was coming off. He was coming off Tommy John, but I expected him to at least be a multi-inning guy out of the bullpen. Yeah, which would have been huge because if you have one of those guys struggling as a starter, he comes in, pitches two or three solid innings out of the pen. That would have been he, he, great for him. But he actually deals with a bunch of personal stuff. I think he's one of those one of the guys that were they were. I think they were mentioning with him with like um, depression and anxiety and That's all this tough stuff. In baseball it kills. Well, and I think a lot of it was just all this stuff going on right now. Right was really messing with him but that's not hasn't been confirmed that was just one, one coach put out there which you probably shouldn't have like it was a really bad look like why would the coach do that yeah. but yeah they did and yeah i mean certainly it. certainly feel for him we you know we kind of we understand I, all that stuff going there's a on, human but... aspect there's yeah. a human aspect to the sport people forget i'm guilty of it and it, go, it goes even like beyond this stuff like this stuff is like it's a serious mental like mental issues that need to be addressed serious you know things that go on in these people's lives but then just going back to performances there's a per, there's a player that makes no sense why they're struggling they might they might just there's times where they they can't see a baseball they're just not picking up on the baseball but then there's times where our players like yeah that baseball looks like a beach ball and they're just crushing it and there's just hot streaks happen and some it's sports like you say like, we've seen it just we've seen the miracle on ice we've seen these amazing we saw ray allen's three in game six of the finals for the heat we've just seen these amazing things happen that just make no sense but they just do they're just miraculous and you just you can't quantify those things sometimes in sports and right. I, I i'm really big on tangents i apologize as you were no no <laughs> worries uh yeah we're you know that's the, that's the aspect of the game whether you're, whether you're watching as a fan you're betting you're, you're playing fantasy like you know you're you're not going to be able to gauge this stuff you're not you're really not so it's really about getting as much information as you can, putting as much into perspective as you can and really making the best educated guess at the end of the day. And, um, and again, you know, that's why you look for professionals uh, like ourselves over here uh, to try and give you some advice on that. And uh, Mike, the last thing I want to ask you before I let you go is um, I know, you know, it, it depends on the draft depends on the team, but overall, do you have any sleepers guys that, um, you know, might have a better season than expected that you are looking for for this year? All right, so I told you a little bit behind the scenes why I'm wearing this hat. I'm actually a Marlins fan, so I'm already a glutton for punishment. But I just realized I'm really high on a lot of the Seattle's Mariners players, and by high I mean those are because sleepers these days in the in the in the in the fantasy world are really tough to come by because the information is readily available and there's everyone is talking about them all the time. So I dug deep. You told me you wanted sleepers. I brought guys that aren't even uh, that are even free agents in 15 team leagues like your deepest of leagues so the guys like shed long and guys like kyle lewis you see there's a trend here i'm wearing the hat evan white these guys are owned in like 10 percent or less yahoo leagues and these are all guys that i expect just based on playing time alone you know they're gonna get it but then you have shed long who's had multiple seasons in the minors with double digit stolen bases stolen bases are so so valuable in fantasy right now especially with most leagues shifting to a roto aspect which is basically taking all the if people don't know what roto is it's taking all the categories and adding them up so you have you, you have stolen bases and it takes your team's total and adds it up and stolen bases are really hard to come by and shed long should we not only will he offer you some stolen bases but he's leading off so he's getting those plate appearances we talked about earlier and being a, valuable and being an asset in a shortened season so you're getting that you're getting a leadoff guy who can still base it's perfect you have kyle lewis who can just crush the ball the guy had like in it was such a small sample but he had like the second best barrel rate, the fifth best exit velocity on fly balls, line drives, 
over 75 uh, plate appearance um, sample in, the, in a short season last year. And this is the, the best of all players with at least 75 plate appearances. So when I say small sample, it's small sample. And and then there's another stat that's very, very advanced. Basically, he had the second most repeatable or like the fourth most repeatable swing is like is a way of kind of just putting it in layman's terms. And basically what all that fancy stuff is saying that he could just crush a ball. He can absolutely demolish right. a ball. He might hit 250 in the process because he's just he hits a lot. Of, he hits too many ground balls for for our liking, but he can crush a ball. He's crushing in spring. Should slot somewhere between that four and six hole, which should lead to like some underrated RBI opportunities. The Mariners don't have the easiest schedule, but again, it's all about playing time. It's all about p- uh, potential, and these guys just line up. Eric Thames is another name for the Nationals that. This is just more of a playing time. We've seen him crush the ball for the Brewers before. We know the type of runs he can go on, but he should be playing every day or just about. Ryan Zimmerman opted out. That leaves him kind of playing every day for first base and the guy that's just being overlooked. And Evan White, again, back to, back to the Mariners, that uh, just kind of like a poor man's Paul Goldschmidt. Just He's a he's a prospect with no real track record, but the guy's uh, overall tools and everything pretty much make him a five-category contributor. Batting average might be a little iffy the first year because he's a rookie, but – I'm not sure where he's banging in the lineup either. I've seen, I see my my early takeaways. He was always being bat, being hit in between the two and six hole. We haven't seen anything to suggest where he's batting in summer yet. He, they haven't played a single game, so watching out for that. But those are like four names that come to mind right away as far as like true sleepers. Because I could have given you other names that are going a little earlier, but again, with the way the fantasy landscape has turned out, with the amount of amazing analysis and amazing analysts out there, sleepers are the term is almost going away. It's almost becoming like value the word values like the word sleepers like transforming into the word value but i'm trying to go deep and those names are guys that just aren't roster a ton that deserve attention that if you're in a shallow format just put them on your watch list you can't make room for them right now actually there's one guy that's literally i went to adam today zero percent owned this is as deep as it gets zero percent owned in yahoo leagues and it's edward edward i think it's edward eduardo alvarez for the for the padres this is a guy that's stolen like 20 plus bags the last two years in the minors and also offers a little pop. He was um, they traded Franchi Cordero, and I think it was a, it was also that was in a way to get this guy playing time. I wasn't the first guy to even notice him in this industry. I can't say I was, but he's zero percent owned in Yahoo leagues. And again, speed being the the such a, the need it is, he's a guy that you need to monitor because if he's getting everyday playing time, even if he's batting ninth like he did tonight in the summer league game, it's still a guy who can provide you those steals, and he is free in all drafts. Definitely, that's, that's it. that Probably. outfielder Edward <laughs> Olivares. Olivares, see, I, yeah. I was like, I, Edward, I was like, I, I, I haven't read about him. I, I actually own him in some deeper leagues, and so I know who he is. But he's just a name, literally, in Yahoo leagues. If you look him up in Yahoo, which is probably the most commonly played fantasy, you know, for for year or for for the year, or whatever. I can't think of the word name. It doesn't matter. He's literally says zero percent ownership next to his name. So talk about deep. That's as deep as it gets <laughs> for those formats. Definitely for sure. So, um, you know, again, thank you so much for taking this time and, you know, we really appreciate it. And, you know, we hope everybody was able to take some, some insight from this conversation just about teams in general, really, you know, you can see kind of how we're talking about them in a way to say, you know, this is what we're doing when we're looking at these teams and how we kind of attempt to break them down and, and attempt to, you know, look at the individual players as well as look at the team overall and, and how that really affects both the betting and the fantasy market. So again, you know, I really appreciate that insight. No, it's my pleasure, man. Honestly, I always appreciate being brought on the shows, man. Thank you for reaching out and um, getting me on here. Yep, for sure. Thank you. My pleasure, man.